Uh, good afternoon, my name is Keith Brindle. I am the uh, vicar at St. James's Church, and I'm also the chair of the uh, Churches Together in Devices, who are hosting this Devices area hosting. So thank you very much for um, coming out tonight. Some of you got here a little bit earlier than others because on some social media the start time was 7 o'clock. Uh, those of you that have been here for a little bit longer, I hope you can stay with us the, the rest of the evening and remain comfortably in your seats for, for the duration. Uh, just to, some housekeeping stuff. There is no fire alarm that is planned to happen. So if you hear is it a continuous beep, beep, a continuous sound, beep, 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 beep. If you hear a beep, 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 there's an emergency exit there. There's an emergency exit there. And there's an emergency exit uh, through the door that you came out of, and we're not expecting um, any um, testing of the fire alarms. Toilets are um, to my right and through there, and go all the way through, and they're on your left hand side. And I think we've got apart from that, and can just make sure that your mobile phones are either turned off or switched to silent. That would be great. So before I hand over to Sue Groove, who is the Archdeacon <coughs> for uh, this area, who's going to chair the event, I just want to um, open the uh, evening with a prayer. I had the privilege of being here at Devizes School uh, last Monday, which was Armistice Day, and uh, the school did a really good job, as it does every year, of um, helping the young people of the school to remember uh, those that had uh, lost their lives or uh, had their lives severely disrupted uh, by the young wars and those that are still in the forces and those individuals that suffered the effects of war then and now. And as part of the prayer that I said then, I prayed for the forthcoming general election. So I want to use the words that I used in that prayer on um, Armistice Day to uh, open this up. So could we just pray? Lord, as we approach elections for a new government, give politicians, political parties, commentators, and each one of us wisdom and sensitivity in what we say and do at this time. Give us ears to listen well to those with differing political views and guide all politicians to operate from a place of integrity, truth and service. Help them to see the shared humanity and the shared frailty they have with their political opponents. To build up for the sake of our nation rather than to tear down for the sake of political point scoring. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, Keith. In case you haven't noticed, the proceedings are being videoed and they're also being recorded for radio, for local Fantasy FM radio. So if you miss anything, you'll have other opportunities to catch up. The way the evening's going to pan out is each candidate, um, to start with, we're just going to go along the table, missing me, is going to have five minutes to uh, introduce themselves and talk about uh, why they want to represent you in Parliament. Uh, when we've had the four lots of five minute introductions, we're then going to take some of the questions you've already written down um, on pieces of paper and ask those of the candidates in turn, and then we'll have a time of open questions. I'd ask you please to um, be respectful, I'm sure you will, um, and to listen and not interrupt. It'll make it much easier for the recordings if we can keep things running smoothly. And then um, at about uh, quarter past, twenty past nine, I will call time and we'll give each of the candidates two minutes to add in anything else they haven't had time to say that they think is quite important to say, they felt they haven't answered the question, or whatever. We'll give them two minutes each at the end. We will actually um, restrict the length of time they can answer any question on, and I believe that's two minutes as well, and there will be a signal to tell us that the time's up. So we can see a big clock up there, just to remind them. And look, um, uh, would you like to be in the seating with your final yeah. question, please? Thank you. Okay, good to see everybody. Thanks for coming out. There's a bit of opposition out there with a head to head, but this is going to be much more fun. Okay, I'm going to start with a little bit of background about myself. Can you all hear at the back okay? Is that all right? Yeah. Great, thank you. A little bit of background about myself, and then I'm going to share with you what Labour will bring to devices and our whole constituency. So I live about 15 minutes away in the Pusey Vale. 
Um, and Devizes has been my hometown now for about 25 years, actually. I'm a local businesswoman and a mum, and my work has involved me travelling all over Europe and beyond, working at board level with executives, advising on equality and leadership. And about 40 years ago, somebody reminded me I studied foreign languages at Cambridge University. So I was thinking about uh, Armistice Day, actually, too, and about key moments in history. And I was reminded how, after World War II, we rebuilt Britain with a Marshall Plan for post-war Europe. And the refinery, where I worked at Forley, Southampton, in industrial relations, was actually built partly by Marshall Plan money. And I believe that, again, we've reached a crucial moment in history today. We need to choose what kind of country we want to be. Two years ago, I was so disheartened by the direction that our country is heading, I decided to stop shouting at the telly and get up and do something. I joined the Labour Party, whose values of community, respect and equality were the same as mine. And I also admired that fully positive manifesto that they put together in 2017. So I started to get more involved in community issues, and for a few years now, I've been volunteering locally. I'm a trustee with two local charities, including Open Doors here in Devizes. And that's where I see firsthand, actually, the, the, the impact of 10 years of austerity. My real wake-up call, though, was working with parents in the community, campaigning to overturn Wiltshire Council decision to close Oxenwood and Brayside outdoor education centres. And I'm pleased to say that Parent Power and Good Organisation won the day and those community assets now remain here for our children and our grandchildren. So now I'm a campaigner, and a campaigner for change, real change. And what does Labour offer us then, here in Devizes and beyond? Our Brexit offer, let's get that out of the way first, is straightforward. We'll go back to the people for a final say on Brexit. The Tories at the Brexit Party, or sorry, I should say that the Tories are the Brexit Party now, want to crash out with a very hard Brexit either a crash out or an old Brexit. The Lib Dems, on the other hand, want to go for a folk. Um, Labour, it seems to me, is the sensible centre. But there is so much more that we need to att attack, really, with true post-war zeal, um, more than Brexit. There's much more we need to achieve. Our health and social care system have been chronically run down by the last 10 years of government. We need to make mental health and housing a top priority here, particularly for our, our military veterans and our young people. Labour will save the NHS from further privatisation and will provide free personal care for the elderly, as is already the case in Scotland. So here in Devizes, we've actually witnessed the creeping privatisation of the NHS. Devizes has been campaigning for years for a local urgent care centre, as you know. The Minor Injuries Unit closed in 2006. We were promised a new urgent care centre repeatedly by um, the MP and Wiltshire Council going back to 2013. It was due to open in 2017, and as of last night at the local area board, we were told 2021, probably. So I will continue to fight for resources to improve also our local schools and youth centres, which have been cut back to unsustainable levels, it seems to me. So last night at the area board in Devizes, we heard about we heard from an anti-social behaviour officer um, who's working hard with really the toughest of cases and across different agencies. Her team, when she was asked how is she getting on, are there, is there enough resources, she said no, there is not. Our team has reduced from five to two people over the last few years and we do not have enough people. And this is the same story across public services generally. So we will set our sights high with good education as a right, not a privilege, and no tuition fees for students. Responding to the climate of emergency, our new green industrial revolution will generate 200,000 good construction jobs, and our Warm Homes for All programme is the largest upgrade of UK housing since Labour's post-war reconstruction. We desperately need this change. And I feel we're coming to that point where we have to make a critical decision. It's an existential threat. We need the radical change that Labour will bring, and that is why I stand before you tonight. I'd be honoured to serve as your MP. Thank you. Danny Kruger, I'm your 
Conservative <laughs> candidate in the election. I'm going to speak quickly about who I am to introduce myself and then try and explain a bit about what I would like to see uh, to, uh, to, to help do here in, in, in devices. I, uh, so I grew up on a farm in the Cotswolds. My parents uh, ran a catering business that um, uh, did, very, did very well and they gave me a very good education. And uh, I, uh, I know this area well, I'm not from here, but I, I know well my, many of my wife's family are from here. I've spent many uh, weekends here, I love the area, but I don't know it, I'm not going to stand here. And Rachel um, has shown how, how uh, locally rooted she is. I'm not, so I'm not here to pretend that I have the answers or that I know the area uh, as well as I would need to. So I'm here to listen and to, uh, and to learn, and I hope that uh, in the course of this evening, we can have a really constructive conversation about priorities for, for the neighbourhood. Um, I spent 12 years running charities. I, I started a charity working in prisons and uh, working with ex-offenders that I ran with my wife, Emma. And we did that for about eight years and that, that work carries on and I'll share the board uh, of the charity. After that, I started a project working with younger people, with children and young people and their families to help uh, prevent things going wrong in their lives. Uh, and then more recently, I was briefly a civil servant, and then since uh, since July, I've been working in number 10 Downing Street. I'm the uh, Prime Minister's political secretary, which means I have the uh, job of liaising with Parliament <coughs> on behalf of the PM, which I've not done with great success uh, in the last few months, as you noticed, uh, hence this election we're, we're, we're having. Uh, so uh, I voted Leave in the referendum. I was a proud, a proud Brexiteer. I think it was the right thing for the country. I was very proud of the country for voting to Leave. But I recognise it only did so by a small majority, and there are many people uh, who still remain very opposed to Brexit. So my view is that we should absolutely respect the reasons that people gave when they voted Remain, but that we should fulfil the democratic decision of the country. We have to honour that referendum result and see Brexit through. And I think that people who uh, are opposed to Brexit uh, should then be campaigning. If they want a second referendum, let's fulfil the first referendum first. And then if people want to campaign to join the EU, that is absolutely fine. But let us honour the first one uh, before we do that. Uh, my uh, main reason for thinking we should honour the referendum is that people voted for it, and it's a simple question of, of democracy. But the other reason is to get Brexit done and to focus on domestic policy once again. So a quick word on that. I've been having a lot of conversations about, and Rachel just mentioned some of them, about the challenges that our public services have in this area. There is a real problem with the funding formula, speaking to Phil Bevan, the head, they've had a number of conversations with him about the challenges that schools have around the national funding formula not, uh, not being fair in market towns and rural communities. The same applies for the police and the health service. So there's a big job to do in reconciling uh, uh, the national funding formulas. There's a job to do on transport. We hear a lot about the challenges of the bus network being not nowhere near good enough. The last sessions we had in Fusi, there was a lot of talk about uh, transport for children with special educational needs. There's huge challenges in a, in a, in a you know, very large rural community like this around transport that needs to be fixed. But my passion, and to end on, my, my political philosophy, as it were, the reason I'm in politics, the work that I've done. Uh, up till now, it's all been about community and about the resources of a community, about the power of people coming together to make change locally. And, I mean, for what it's worth, my belief in Brexit is because I think we need to have power more local uh, and less, uh, you know, decisions need to be taken as close to people as possible. So I hope that as power comes back to Westminster from Brussels, there is a further process of handing power on to communities, uh, to, to counties and to towns and to parishes. Because there is so much resource in our neighbourhood, so much skill and expertise and passion and experience that can't be, uh, can't be delegated upwards to, to Whitehall. I mean, today uh, I was in Fusey in Rachel's area and I met a, um, and, you know, the Dubs Farm is an amazing business, a family owned business, uh, which you know, resisted the opportunity to sell out to, 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 to big international firms. They employ a lot of local people, they're absolutely rooted in this neighbourhood and their passion is about, is about supporting the community that they're in. I visited a nursery, Sunflower, you know, where the, uh, it was a, a, a small primary school uh, that had to close down. So the community rallied around, started a charity, taking it over, and making huge success of this nursery. 
I, I, I went to the Crown and Lancaster pub, uh, which again, another, another, another example of where the community is popping out of business, it's going to be redeveloping flats, they made their ticket over. So that is a philosophy that I believe in, and I hope we'll talk more about that later. Thank you. Thank you. in this, my home constituency, which I moved to in 2013 with my husband, my children, my dogs and my small business. Being an MP was never on my personal agenda until now. I'm not a career politician, but I'm standing because I'm appalled by the lurch to the extreme left by the Labour Party and the lurch to the extreme right by the Conservative Party. I believe in the open and tolerant society that the Liberal Democrats have always stood for. I'm standing because the social contract is broken. Working hard is no longer a guarantee to a warm home to live in, food on the table, health and social care when you need them, and a good education for your children. And no matter what Johnson and Farage say, Brexit will not fix this, it will only make matters worse. I was at a large European information technology conference in Vienna when the EU referendum result came in. I remember my feelings as I walked into that conference the following day feeling so downhearted and dreading the reaction of my European friends. I need to be treated with kindness and concern. Remaining in the EU is not only about projecting jobs, it's about identity and the opportunities for our children. I am English, I am British, I am European. I have lived, worked and studied in other EU countries and I want the same freedom for my children. I do not want my country to be a low regulation, low tax, no public services offshoot of the USA. I joined the Liberal Democrats Party when the snap election was called in 2017 and I helped with that campaign. The Liberal Democrats offered a clear Remain voice and a plan for a referendum on the deal. I have marched with the Liberal Democrats and many of you on the People's Vote marches in London. And earlier this year, I was honoured when the local Liberal Democrat Party <coughs> selected me to be their parliamentary candidate. While stopping Brexit was what got me involved, it is not the only thing I care about. Locally, I have campaigned to reduce the travel times of children with special educational needs and against the closure of Bradford Special School near here. I've also been involved in the Liberal Democrats' motion at Wiltshire Council to declare a climate emergency. Climate change really worries me. The most important message from climate scientists is we need to start worldwide reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. The political parties are so focused on trying to outcompete each other over when they plan to be carbon neutral that they're not actually getting started. We have the technology, we need the political will, and we cannot delay any longer. So that's just a few things that matter to me, and what I would really like to hear now is what matters to you. Thank you. turn our juggernaut of a, an economy around to prevent irreversible damaging changes to our climate. The United Nations has put together expert scientists from around the world and this is what they tell us. Further, they told us that the ambition in the 2015 Paris Agreement needs to be five times higher to have a chance of staying below 1.5 degrees warming. Five times. The UK is not even on track to meet its next target, let alone a target five times higher. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a climate emergency. Leaving this to private enterprise to solve will not work. The costs of polluting the planet are not what economists call internalised, which means it just isn't profitable. We propose a tax on carbon with the proceeds distributed as an income to everyone. 
Mr Hammond, our ex-Chancellor, calculated that the necessary measures to obtain net zero would cost £1.4 trillion. Pounds. Our calculations give a similar result, and we propose spending £100 billion a year to obtain net zero by 2030. This will create good purposeful work all around the country, installing onshore and offshore wind turbines, solar power stations, insulating people's homes and workplaces, electrifying and improving public transport, and investing in research and development to aid both industry and farming to transition to net zero, and also to capture and store carbon. We need to start now. The Green Party understands science and has policies based on evidence. We tell the truth. Our policies are developed with input from experts. I'm a Cambridge graduate, I have a PhD in material science and an MBA. Economics has been my passion for the last two decades. I'm not your best candidate for opening country fates or holding cocktail parties. I don't want to spend my time treating the symptoms of our failed system by doing charity work. I want to treat the root causes of our failing society, which stem from a lack of understanding about how the economy works. Economics is not a science. It's not possible to predict the future well, as much depends on people's behaviour. However, some myths in economics need to be busted. One is that government spending is constrained by tax income. It is not. A government in a country like ours, with its own national currency, can always borrow at reasonable rates. The current 10-year borrowing rate is 0.75%. Businesses can't borrow anything like such low rates. Austerity, the awful spending cuts we've had over the last 10 years, was never necessary. People have died and are still dying from this policy. And furthermore, it means people understandably don't want money spent tackling climate change when it appears there isn't enough money even for our key public services like the NHS. They have been conned there was always enough money. Think about the Second World War. Did we stop to ask if we had the money to fight the war? No, of course we didn't. We just got on and did what we had to. How many soldiers could be trained quickly? How quickly could factories be transformed to start making munitions? Manpower, not money, was and is the true constraint. Ladies and gentlemen, government cuts are, were not an economic necessity but a political choice. When other parties speak of things like fiscal discipline, they align or they don't understand. Governments like ours can always find money when they want to. Now we need to reverse austerity and invest to enable a zero carbon economy. Only the Green Party really gets this. For your children's future, vote Green. first. Um, we need to be very careful about house building. The 
concrete and things like that uses a huge amount of carbon so that retrofitting and insulation is better than building new but of course we need more housing so we want to build um, 100,000 houses a year to the passive house standard um, so um, we have that extra housing also then transport up, upgrading our rail um, so it's all electric um, getting you know, cycle, cycleways and electric car points all over the place um, training will be absolutely key to do all this new work that we need to do so we need to get you know get that going we want to put r d expenditure into carbon capture and storage um is anybody time the two minutes yeah? <laughs> <laughs> like, i'll stop there for now. <laughs> right that's what that, that's what the plan is <laughs> lots of details <laughs> should we work that way along this way Would you want to okay yeah. so uh joe i don't sorry it was quite nice that you could see a uh, question joe, joe, so, okay. okay it's not i quite like to direct my answer <laughs> So the Liberal Democrats, we actually have a series of interim targets. So the first one is to have 80% of our electricity generated by renewables by 20, oh gosh, 2030, and to be carbon neutral by 2045. Um, we plan to do that by obviously investing in renewable energy. I mean, it's a lot of the same uh, answers that Emma gave. Um, we need to have more solar, more wind, more tidal and, um, energy. We want to um, retrofit the homes to obviously, you know, the, if we make homes more, not energy efficient, uh, insulated, that's the word I'm looking for, um, then obviously that will reduce their usage of um, energy. Um, gosh, I've got a whole list of things on here as well, which, which one should we go on to? Um, we want to empower local authorities to deal with climate emergencies themselves. So Wiltshire Council declared a climate emergency. And they're obviously it's fine for them to make actions on that. So we really need to encourage people at every level to take this seriously. Um, obviously, we're going to ban fracking. I mean, we have um, we can't burn all the fossil fuels we've already found. So we're going over that 1.5 target. So why are we even looking for more? Um, what else? And we would introduce a frequent flyer tax. So 15. 70% of all flights are by 15% of the people who fly, which is quite a statistic I, um, I found interesting. And obviously we want to support farmers, because we think farmers are definitely part of the solution. We think we should subsidise, pay farmers for the climate, set, for the cons con conservation services that they provide, because they're definitely part of the solution. And I think... Again, I could probably go on for some time, but I imagine that two minutes is up. Can I check? Who's doing the two minutes? Is it me watching that? Oh, we have got someone who is actually planning for us. Oh, okay. So we have Let's do something. Hi. Sorry. Oh. I think it's a Two minutes is right. Thank you. I'm just checking it is actually happening. You're not expecting to be the I've got like someone had the time. Yeah, there we go. Okay, brilliant. It is actually happening, we just haven't hit two minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so I agree uh, that this is extremely urgent, and yet I would say that the fundamental answer to the climate uh, challenge is innovation and the opportunities that a productive capitalist economy creates to produce technology that reduces fossil fuel consumption and makes for cleaner energy and a cleaner economy. And the way to do that is not to crash the economy now. I think 2030 is a un unachievable, unachievably ambitious target. And uh, to try and change our entire economy and the entire basis of the way that we live within 10 years uh, would be uh, incredibly destructive and dangerous. Do you think by 2050, which is the official government target for this, is ambitious enough? That's a huge change uh, within a couple of decades to, uh, to reorganise our economy. So that's the, uh, that's the, the answer to the question about what the target is. Uh, how to get there, as I say, innovation, and the government should, is doing a huge amount to invest in our science base, to develop new forms of, uh, of, of energy, of transport, housing, uh, and, and industry. And so we're also, we also need to do a lot, and we just heard about the importance of our rural environment. Uh, you know, there's a huge, government's announced a huge new tree planting program to triple the... Uh, the rate of tree planting in this country in the coming years to protect our peatlands, which is great carbon sinks, uh, which, uh, which helps neutralise the effects of, our, of, of carbon. 
Uh, and lastly, the subsidy system that can be created post-Brexit once we leave the EU and their common agricultural policy means that we can reward farmers for environmental stewardship in a way that hasn't been <coughs> possible up till now. So the whole focus of, of, of farming policy is going to be about supporting animal welfare and, uh, and environmental stewardship uh, so that we can, have, we can continue to have in this area as a, as a great example of it. Uh, you know, a beautiful countryside that, that helps to offset carbon. So I, I think, I'm afraid I disagree. Uh, <laughs> okay. So we are facing an existential crisis. Um, and I think that requires ambition, huge ambition and vision. And I feel that's what's lacking at the moment. So actually in business, you set an ambitious stretching target. And then yes, the innovation can come in and respond to that. But I believe that that target is important, a really stretching target. There's a transformation, a green transformation fund that Labour's put together. 250 billion is required, we believe, to really turn around and yes, change the economy, absolutely. So we need vision, we need strategy. We also need a holistic approach. In other words, it has to all tie in together. And what worries me is up to now, we've seen sort of piecemeal change, bits and pieces here and there. We actually had some really good things going on in terms of solar and other um, schemes, if you remember, a few years back. But those were stopped. And that actually caused uh, the renewable sector to really struggle and to, and to founder. Um, my own nephew is actually working in this area with Grist locally. Um, and he was explaining what effect it had had on, on the industry. So Labour's got a very practical approach. It's going to say that things like the Honda situation in Swindon, why don't we build a new factory, a gigafactory as it would be called, and Swindon has been identified as one of these sites. So we will build a new factory which will, which will manufacture batteries um, of the sort that we need and the amount that we need, and we'll replace some of those lost jobs at Honda. So a very practical thing. We'll think about solar panels for community centres and libraries as well as uh, for private use. So we need a much more strategic approach across the whole country. I'm glad that Labour talks about <coughs> a new industrial revolution because that's what we need. Thank you. Um, our next question is from John Hargreaves. Do you want to give us a wave so they know who to look at? They, ah, brilliant, thank you. John asks, what will you and your respective parties do about the national debt and the deficit? Where should we start? Who wants to start? Can we start here? Sure. Yeah, go okay. um, thank you. Uh, a good question. Uh, I don't think it's the case that government can always find money. Money has to come from somewhere. And yes, it's true that borrowing rates are historically low. And this gives us a great opportunity to invest in the infrastructure which will, over time, help to power our economy, create tax revenues, enable us to pay down more of our debt. As you know, um, the Conservative government has, and the coalition government before it, has worked hard and you know, with significant pain in all parts of the country to reduce uh, the deficit. We haven't reduced it entirely, so national debt has continued to grow. We still, have, we still carry a very large uh, debt, and our, it's our children's responsibility if we don't pay it off. So I do believe in fiscal responsibility. I think that is a meaningful concept, and I hope over time that this government, if we're re-elected, will uh, continue to reduce the deficit. But the plan is, is that there should be balance in the cycle, so that we should not uh, borrow more than we spend over the economic cycle. That doesn't mean we can't borrow now, and I'm actually in favour. I'm, I'm one of those who thinks we should be investing in in infrastructure uh, and uh, particularly in supporting, you know, we have to very quickly, we have a, our economy is so focused on the southeast, we've got to spread prosperity and opportunity across all parts of the country. And this is Boris Johnson's big matter about levelling leveling up. And I think it's acceptable to borrow to pay for that. But, uh, but over time, we do need to continue to reduce the deficit so that one day we can actually be paying back our debt. Thank you. Hi John, um, I think one way we can certainly help 
lower our national debt, if not by leaving the EU and crushing our economy. Um, I also think that we should um, try and reduce that deficit as much as we can. Obviously, we need to be fiscally responsible. Um, and I'm going to say that actually our manifesto comes out tomorrow, and I must admit, the economy is one section that I haven't really read up on, which sounds terrible, and I do apologise. Um, so I'm not going to say much more without having checked against my manifesto. So um, the national debt, it's, it's fascinating why people are, are worried about it. Um, I want to say, if you think about how money comes into circulation, I wonder how many people think it's the Bank of England that brings money into circulation. Often a lot of people think it is. That isn't the case. The banks bring money into circulation. Every time you go and get um, a loan from the bank, the bank can create this money. It is created hand in hand with debt. And um, so that for anybody who's got a plus, somebody else has got a minus. So if the government um, has, is sort of using money, if, if they've got a minus, that means we've got a plus. That means that, you know, people have got, um, if you have investments, you, you might know that you, you have things like called government gilts. These are government bonds. The, this is the national debt. You know, it's a very useful thing to have in our pension funds. It's not something to be absolutely terrified of. We don't spend a huge amount of money at the moment servicing it. We've, we've, we're totally worried about something that is not particularly relevant. I mean, like, you know, if, if climate change is constantly getting worse um, in the, the, the prognosis of what's going to happen, scientists are telling us, well, you know, so what, you know, if we, if we sort of, you know, our, our grandchildren all die, but the country is, you know, running a surplus, you know, whereas, is that a good thing? You know, no, it's not. You know, if we're, you know, the next generations are all alive, but they've got a bit of debt, does that really matter? You know? Priorities. There we go. <laughs> so, the GDP currently is at its uh, at a low level. So we're not growing terribly well. We're not very productive. We're one of the least productive countries in Europe. And that's, that's worrying. So, we need to completely re-energise and invest in our economy. It's been under-invested for so long. And that can change and will change. As we've heard, austerity is a political choice. And in fact, the IMF, way back in 20, uh, earlier on, some, some years ago now, said that it's not a wise choice, it's not a wise way to go, back in 2013. So in many ways, the country's been starved of investment. Now, I'm a, a sensible businesswoman. I've run a profitable business for, goodness, 30 years or so with my husband. So I'm, I think of myself as a, as a sensible, sound um, manager of money. And I know people worry, well, hang on, will Labour spend loads of money? I actually would counter that and say, no. We have in John McDonnell a very sensible, bright, intellectual economist who has brought around him a very strong team. And I heard him today talking about just this topic. And I think I have friends, colleagues in the city who are saying, do you know that man needs to be listened to? He's a sensible guy. So when people in the city are saying that, we need to sit up and take notice. So I, I would urge you to not worry about some of the sort of nonsense that you hear about Labour would make a mess of the economy. If, of course it won't. It doesn't want to. It wants to do the best for our country. And this country needs a, a kickstart in terms of investment just as it did with the Marshall Plan post-45, which some of the older members will, will remember those days, where we did exactly as Emma's saying, we invested in, in growth, and that growth then stimulated the economy and led to further, further change and further prospects. Thank you. Um, next one is from Rod Evans. Rod Evans? Oh, hi. Okay. And uh, your question is, what will you and your party do to heal, protect, and develop the National Health Service, both nationally and locally? Emma, would you like to pick us up on that one? Okay, well, um, 
we believe that the National Health Service has been terribly, terribly starved. And um, you know, it is, I think that the um, many health professionals are under so much stress because um, you know, of the cuts. And then, you know, they're then leaving because the stress is so bad. So, you know, we want to, um, you know, give more money to the health service and, you know, reverse these, these awful cuts. Um, at the same time, we also want to develop um, local um, health centres which really look at, um, um, you know, very, very broadly about mental health and um, can help people to, you know, get healthy by, by um, maybe helping them with exercise, maybe with insulating their houses if they're living in too cold conditions, do everything that's necessary to, so that people can live, um, live healthy. Um, so yeah, it's all about sort of, you know, living healthily, but the first thing is just to get, you know, to get more fund, funding back into the health service. So uh, it is indeed uh, underfunded. Our beloved NHS is actually in a critical state, I think. Um, hospitals in England have 10,000 vacancies for doctors, 43,000 vacancies for nurses. And meantime, the nursing bursary has been removed. We know, thanks to a very compelling Channel 4 Dispatches programme, um, that if a US trade deal takes place, our pharma, uh, our pharmaceuticals, our medicines are likely to move uh, to expand by about a hundred times. It will be the beginning of the end, the last chapter of the privatisation of the NHS. Now, locally, we know a lot about this. Um, so, as a rural constituency, um, we've had to really campaign hard to keep Savanac Hospital open, for example, and in devices. We talked earlier about the closure of the minor mining injuries unit. But this goes back many, many years. We've had a campaigning um, force going on in devices to try and put this right. So in 2018, we were promised that we would have a care centre open. We're still waiting. As of last night, I asked at the um, area board, and there were mutterings about, well, possibly 2021, probably. In Tidworth, where I've been locally more recently, there's been, as you know, large numbers of troops returning from, from Germany, rebasing. There simply aren't enough doctors' uh, surgery places. There's one surgery there, and people can wait five weeks, six weeks for an appointment. So I'm very worried about the NHS, very worried indeed. We think when something says NHS, that it's, it's still owned by it, but a lot of them aren't. So around here, Care UK, run a lot of the centres, as you all know. And the trouble with that is that who's actually benefiting? So it's about the people who own Care and Care. That's the people who we need to be worried about. But it's, those are the people who are going to benefit, not us. Thank you. So, so, so quickly, I, uh, I, I'm afraid it's just not true that the... Uh, the NHS budget has been cut, in fact, it's risen year on year, all through the, the time that other services were being cut over the last decade. The, the, the problem is that the funding has not kept up with demand, so it's true, there are huge shortages of, of, of funding. You know, I was with a doctor today uh, in Burbage who was making this point about how hard it is to, to, to serve this community. So there is a, there is a funding problem, but, it, but demand is consistently and always has outstripped the provision of healthcare that the NHS manage and uh, another uh, an another vision is necessary so part of it is about getting more money in and you know the claim is 350 million pounds and Boris put on that plus uh, is now flowing into the NHS 350 million pounds a week <laughs> 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 The money is flowing into the NHS now, and uh, the, the, the challenge, of course, is to get to the front line and to make sure that the uh, health professionals dealing directly with patients get the money that's required, and that is a huge challenge in a vast system like we have. So that is the, the focus. The, 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 uh, the, the, as I understand it, the challenge here, the 
very rural area, huge waiting times for GPs. The, the doctor I was it with today does manage to see GP uh, patients, often on the day that they call in, or within a couple of days, but he's clearly the exception across the area. And for more specialist services, particularly, particularly memory services, dementia, you can be waiting for months and months, even up to a year, for an appointment, which is completely unacceptable. So we do need a better system. So it is about funding, I accept that, and we absolutely support the commitment that the government's making to, to additional funding for the NHS. But the, but the key is, and I think we're, we're in agreement here, we need more local services and we need communities to, uh, to, to, to be strong. So very quickly, social prescribing, which is when people, when, when communities look after each other and when people can access local support in their community rather than having to have a very highly medicalised response. I'll stop there.
up in good trains, just as we can in Europe when we go on holiday. And you think, wow, it all runs so brilliantly here in Italy or France. So cheaper, nationalised rail, that is the key. It is very popular, the idea of renationalising the railway. And I think that would make our case here much easier to achieve because we'd be part of a structured network rather than, I think it's about 22 private rail companies at the moment. Can you imagine how that can possibly work as a system, each of them with their own shareholders? Just not working. Not suggesting we go back to the, you know, some of the, the experiences we remember of national world, it's not all a panacea, but we need something that is structured and runs for us as a country and here locally. And absolutely, if we feel there's a business case for a railway here, let's do it. So the Liberal Democrats wish to extend the rail network, because at the end of the day, with climate change, we need more people to use public service. Um, I would support a, a rail station in Devizes. I was reading a report recently that stated that Devizes was the largest town that had the first, furthest distance to the nearest station or something like that. And I think having a train station here would certainly boost local economy, not just in Devizes, but all the area around it as well, as long as it's connected up with a good bus service as well. I can't believe that you can't get a direct bus between devices in Marlborough right now, it seems absolutely crazy. Um, so yes, I think I've heard there's a good case for it and I would definitely try and champion that we would have devices on, on that list of um, potential news stations. I think I agree very much um, with um, well, everybody. Um, but so, what we feel that um, opening up um, small railway stations around the country really, really makes sense. So, Marlborough as well, it makes a huge amount of sense. There used to be a line going into Marlborough from, from Bedouin, and now um, it's still possible to bring the train very close to Marlborough. We should do that as well as the, the station and devices. Um, what we think is that the, um, the um, high-speed HS2 um, train is, looks like it's a massive um, waste of money and it you know, goes through um, some um, beautiful forest that we shouldn't be cutting down. We would um, stop HS2 and you know, we think that's money badly spent and isn't going to um, help um, you know, sort of small businesses around the country. It's just a vanity project, so we'd stop that. <laughs> and then we come to the last written question. Last but not least, this is from Kate Freeman. Ah, um, right there. What do you like about the EU? <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're well. <laughs> um, oh, I did so many things. So I suppose the key thing is that it is has been the largest peace project that the world has ever known. It had so many countries working together uh, over such a long time. Um, I certainly enjoy my freedom to travel, to live, to study, to work in any one of the other countries. I also like how we, uh, it enables us to um, work together on research, um, on our health service. We have a lot of EU staff and our trained staff, are registered, our, their qualifications are recognised in other countries so that they have the freedom to work in it and work where they want. Um, my cousin is Belgian. So my aunt married a, a, a cheeky Belgian soldier. She met as a nurse in the, in, in, in the Second World War, and they went to move to Belgium. And so my, unfortunately, my aunt died before I was born, so I never met her. But my cousin is Belgian, and we used to spend every summer holiday going over to Belgium. So when I say I am European, I really mean I and my family are European. So for me, it, it is just part of my identity. So I've benefited so much.
much personally. So as a scientist, um, I've um, worked in France, I've um, worked on um, European-sponsored re research projects, um, and you know, you've, you managed to bring together the best people to do that because, because we're part of the, the European Union. Um, I was even I was a stagiary. Yeah, in, at the European Commission, so that um, I've actually worked on that inside and um, seen how it, it's organised a bit. Um, so it, it just, um, I feel, you know, it brings together a huge amount. I mean, like any large organisation, it has its huge failings. Um, I feel that at the moment, you know, the huge failing in this country is in Westminster, not in, in Brussels. So, <laughs> You know, we we need Europe to, to um, fight our biggest problem, which is climate change. In Europe, because there's proportional representation, which we don't have here, the, the Greens are well represented, and they're doing the most amazing job um, at um, you know sort of pulling up, I don't know, all sorts of things like sort of stopping um, companies putting their money in tax havens and uh, you know making sure they, they pay their fair taxes. Um, you know, they're very yeah. There's masses of fantastic stuff happening there, and I'm afraid a trade deal with America will also, any trade deal takes away from sovereignty. You sign something, you agree to standards which you then can't change. A any trade deal does that. Um, so signing up to something with America will mean that they're bigger, we have to accept their standards, which um, they have much, much lower environmental standards. So that is absolutely not the direction we want to go. My husband is Swiss, I think again, her and I both have a, a Swiss husband, so interestingly. So uh, I do have family around Europe and I remember well being sent off on that cross-channel ferry age about 14 to have my first experience of, you know, going to visit a pen friend in France. Um, so Brexit for me was, was a, a, a personal blow, actually. Um, and when you think about it, it was a project that none of us wanted. We none of us were thinking about Brexit before it happened and it's completely dominated our politics in the last three years and has sucked out the oxygen from, from everything else. But you asked Kate about what, what we love about Europe. One of the things I do is I work with academics and I run a programme in Newcastle and uh, Durham University. It's a cross programme, a leadership programme. And the academics I work with, every time I visit them, get more and more dispirited about the fact they are no longer, they are already not being asked to the table. They are not being asked to take part in pan-European uh, projects. And this is groundbreaking new innovative work that we're getting shut out of already. So that's one thing that, that would worry me enormously. Rather, as Emma was saying, climate change, climate change does not respect borders. We need to have cooperation and collaboration across our European partners. And it's only in cooperation with them that we can stand up to the Googles and Facebooks and others and hold them to account as the EU is doing. Um, and without that, the UK will be a much quieter voice. We will not have that same uh, strength of voice. So I'm very worried about where we are now. And I think if we vote uh, for another five years of what, what, we, what we've been experiencing for the last few years, I'm, I'm extremely worried that actually we're going to end up with a crash out deal and that would be appalling, appalling for business, for people, for jobs and for the environment. So, uh, what do I like about the EU? I like its anthem. Uh, Ray Taylor is nice, it's tremendous, uh, uh, glorious. Uh, piece of music. I, um, but the question is about loving the EU, not Europe. We all love Europe. Uh, everybody loves Europe. You know, we love Switzerland, which is not in the EU. Um, uh, and <laughs> the EU is not Europe. Uh, but I do like, you know, I like it. I like, I like what Jean Claude Juncker is a rather brilliant, you know, humorous character. I think we'd all love him if he wasn't on the, the European Commission. 
I'm afraid I don't like uh, I don't like the EU's uh, anti-democratic impulses. I don't like what it's done to Greece and Italy, tell them what, what government they should have. I don't like its aspiration to be a state with its own tax system, its own labour laws, its own foreign policy, its own army. All of the things which the EU set on the wrong track. I think for many years uh, it's been it's set an aspiration to be a new country, to be a single country. And we have decided, the majority of this country have decided that we don't want to belong to that. It's incorrect. And now what we need to do, if we are an independent sovereign country, then we must fulfil the mandate of the people. And then let's see what the European <laughs> Union does and how it evolves. I'm totally up for full, close cooperation, as, 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 as we've just heard. Treaties exist between countries. We've had treaty relationships with European countries for a thousand years. Of course we should have that. Of course we should have a close uh, trade deal with the EU. Of course we should have close cooperation on science and environmental matters and so on, and security. These are completely within the agreement of an independent country. So that's what, that's where we should go. As an independent country. Tory, that actually means your vote doesn't count. It doesn't matter. And the likelihood is that Mr. Krugman will get elected. That's the likelihood. And I know that might upset some of the, the three candidates on here, but they, they, know, they know what the figures are like. And I, my view is that actually this election here is a sham. It's, it's, it gives us an illusion of democracy, as this Hustings does. And my vote will only count in this constituency when we scrap first past the post and introduce some form of proportional representation. It's used in Wales, it's used in Scotland, it's used in the Irish Republic, it's used in Europe. And uh, I wonder whether the uh, candidates agree with me. And if they don't, why not? Um, I think one of the problems that we've had 
after the referendum is the fact that most of the MPs will remain because they looked at all the data and everything, and uh, most more people have voted leave, meant that a lot of people feel that they're not represented by Parliament. Well, I disagree absolutely with the people who think that Brexit is a good idea, but I absolutely think their voice should be represented in Parliament, and I think that this has been a huge problem for this country, and that's part of the reason we're sort of where we are now. So, um, yeah, we need it. If you look at other European countries, they often started in their history with first past the post, and then they changed to proportional representation. They don't have, you know, activists going out every day saying, hey, we need to change back to first past the post, whereas we do have <laughs> activists um, who are going out every day saying, vote, vote fatter. So that, you know, it, it just, it works. So we need to do it. And um, we need to get out urgently. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, so, so quickly, um, I recognise the, the, the argument. I'm afraid I don't agree that just because your party lost your vote didn't count, it was counted. Uh, and every vote is equal, and that is the value of the system that we have. Um, we, the, 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 the case for first past the post is that it establishes a link between the Member of Parliament and the geographical place that they represent. It means that, we, it means that everyone in the community, collectively, decides who their MP is going to be on a, on, a, on a simple competitive system. And elections are competitive. And the person who has the most support in that area represents that area. Then their job is to represent the whole constituency. And that's what a good MP should do, represent everybody, whoever they voted for. So uh, I think we would lose enormously by, uh, by changing the voting system. I fully agree the problem of Parliament at the moment. The problem that we have in Parliament, as we as you just heard, is that there is a Parliament out of step, I'm afraid, with the sentiment in the country. So, and they have declined to fulfil the mandate that they were elected on, which was to deliver Brexit. So the whole system is gummed up, it's stuck, and that's why we're having an election now. That's why it's so important, you know, from my perspective, that we do get a majority in Parliament who's committed to delivering on the referendum. And then and we can, you know, we have traditionally in this country had clear government. It changes every decade or so, but we get clear government. Other countries are not so fortunate, and they have endless confusion, coalition, governments, and they're an elite interchangeable elite take 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 power. Our, our system is, 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 is tough, interchangeable elite. Uh, and our system is tough and competitive, and if you live in a place where there's a strong majority of one party or other, naturally you're, you know, you, you regret it. But that is the basis of our system, it's geographical, and that is a, that is a great advantage. <laughs> about um, the illusion of democracy, pointed that out, and I think we have reached a point where there is a breakdown in trust in our democracy, um, and that is very worrying. I like to think of myself as a bit of a radical, and I use that word in two ways. So, radical in the sense of mould-breaking. I think we need fundamental change in the way we run our democracy. The last three years have demonstrated we have a broken system, but also radical in the sense of rooted. I want to remain rooted in Wiltshire, in this good Wiltshire soil, and not to get lost in a sort of uh, planet parliament up in Westminster. Um, you mentioned about interchangeable elite. I'm sorry. I, I think there's a, there's a pretty unchanging elite at the top at the moment, and that needs breaking. Yes. We cannot continue with a set of politicians who come from a very narrow top of the pyramid from your Eaton's and so on. It's just not working. They are not in touch with the real lives of people out in communities. So it is about trust. And I would ask you to think about who you would trust as your MP. Uh, would you trust someone who to be, to be honest, has been parachuted in from London to, to here? Or would you trust someone who has campaigned and will continue to fight for Wiltshire and for devices? That your votes do matter. There are moments, and 1945 Ackley keeps coming back to me. Labour got in there to bring about real fundamental change. Now is the time where we need that radical, fundamental, real change.
Sue, I wonder if we could just do two one-minute answers from oh, our okay. candidates so that we can get questions. through some more questions yeah, a bit more quickly. Um, okay. Should we have one from over that side? The gentleman there with the glasses on was... Meanwhile, I just was 30 seconds Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Let's <laughs> keep you fit. <laughs> Thanks. Um, in the year 2012, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism reported that the Tory party got over 50% of their donations from the City of London. Does this explain why you have not cleaned up the banking system? The uh, question should be addressed to all four candidates. Well, all four candidates can reply as how they would clean up the banking system. Okay. How would you clean up the banking system? Um, <laughs> well, I think the banks have got it really badly wrong, but I'm not a conspiracy person. I don't think that they set out to get it wrong. I think the whole rules about banking need to be, need to be changed, and the whole rules about banking bonuses and that sort of thing um, need to be changed. Um, so you know, we really need to look at that. And the other thing that we absolutely need to review are the way that political donations work because why should a um, you know, party that you know, tends to be, represent more rich people have this massive backing of money when other parties can't get that? You know, it, it doesn't mean that we have a fair system. So um, that's something that we need to look at as well. really it is about the political donation side of it it's about um, the influence that just a small few elite group of people have over our politics is something of concern to me um, I don't know how necessarily I would change the banking system I'm, I'm not an economist so um, I don't know the answer to that question but I would certainly like to see a review of how we how political parties accept donations Uh, y yes, uh, well obviously I reject the insinuation, sir, um, and th th there's some sort of corruption going on, it's not the case. And the are the banks are things. incredibly corrupt and they're still under multiple investigations yeah. um, and you haven't cleaned up the banking system, yeah, well, so that is well, incorrect. I was, I was just answering the question about the, uh, the, the donations to the Conservative Party. So I. I reject that naturally, and there are tight rules about election spending which have to be followed, and the police get involved with Except to vote leave. So, on your question about the banking system, I think we need to tread carefully, but in the direction that I think you're going. I do recognise that our economy is over financialised. Is we have we have there is too much of the nation's wealth is concentrated in the southeast, as I was suggesting and that is centred on the City of London. So we do need a, a, a better distribution of wealth and of wealth creation across the country, which is why I believe in the necessity of investing in infrastructure uh, and localising power to communities everywhere to get away from this over-financialised model. However, let's not do it in a destructive and hasty way, because actually the finance sector is a quarter of our economy on which our public services depend, so we need to be very careful about how we go there. Big business, including banking, uh, has far too much uh, lobbying power and influence at times. Um, so, you know, looking at a different country in the US, the energy sector has had far too much power and that has caused the, the sort of disinformation, frankly, about climate change and the climate emergency. I used to work for ExxonMobil, I worked in the energy sector. And I have worked for Lloyds Banking Group, so I understand quite a bit about the business world. I worry enormously, and my father-in-law years ago worried enormously about the disproportionate inequality that's pulled apart the very top of businesses and the workers. There's now a huge gap between those two. And it seems to me completely wrong that the money that is made in business is often going into profit just the few people who benefit most the top and actually people at lower down whether it's workers in the bank or elsewhere are having to cope with zero hour contracts and so on and that seems to me completely wrong so yes we need 
a total reform of the way the banking crisis <coughs> affected the country. We didn't respond. I we did, the Corbyn <coughs> did, and they fined the banks. We never did that. The EU's common fisheries policy, by allowing all 27 members to fish off our coast, has created an environmental disaster in the North Sea. Some fish species are almost completely wiped out there. If your party was elected to government, what would you do to reverse that damage? For those that didn't hear, that was fish in the crammer. You can't use that answer. <laughs> I will go back to the crammer for a minute and just say that I think we need to wake up our moonraker spirit. That's what we're about tonight. Partly. So it, it was it, it, the environmental disasters that have been caused in, in lots of different parts of our natural world are, are needing urgent, urgent attention and that much I think we certainly three of us agree on. Um, I, I am not a specialist in fishing policy, I must admit, and one of the things I do uh, believe in is experts. So if I were elected as MP, I would have a series of experts about me. I might actually ask Emma to be an expert on, on green issues. Honestly, I would turn to experts when it comes to uh, asking those sorts of questions and I would probably want to talk to you, sir, about your views, absolutely. So I don't know the sort of uh, technical answer to that, but I do believe that we need to listen to our food, our fishing and our farming communities. And I'm going to be meeting with farmers in due course to talk to them about how Labour will support food and farming production, including fishing. So, I'm not a fish expert either and haven't had cause to think much about the fishing off the Wiltshire coast. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but, I, but, but I thank you, sir, for your question and I, and I concur with the, 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 the sentiment that the uh, common fisheries policy, by making a, uh, a, a, a commons of our waters, has ended up to New England. And I hope that a restoration of sovereignty and a UK made uh, uh, fishing policy will ensure that we are able to, to restore fish stocks. I'm afraid I'm also going to claim to not really know an awful lot about fishing. Um, <laughs> we'll look it up though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I was reading something, although I'm just sort of thinking, I wonder if this is actually to be relied on or not, but I was reading something that um, the EU that, that the UK sold a number of its fishing licenses to other EU countries. So I think that probably hasn't helped the situation at all. I also think that when fish are caught, they shouldn't be thrown overboard, they should be returned, they should come to shore. Because if you caught it and killed it, it's dead. You might well eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to apologise to my vegetarian husband, but am I? Um, yes, yeah, so um, I think, yes, we need to be very careful with environmental controls on the seas. Of course, we want to ensure that our seas are operating as they should, uh, not least because of the carbon that they, they store as well. So, um, uh, I'm also not an expert in fishing, but I do believe that working, you know, fish move around, clearly, they swim around. Um, we need to work together with um, um, our um, you know, European colleagues um, on this. Um, and one thing that um, struck in my mind that, that um, I heard is that um, Nigel Farage's MEP was assigned to work on the fishing committee. He never, he never turned up. He didn't argue our cause. He didn't go along to the meetings. So how can you expect for this country to have got you know, good deals and stuff? So um, that was um, clearly a problem, um, yeah. And we need the experts to come in and work out, you know, what actually needs to be done. And we need to work with our European, um, other European countries to, to um, organise it fairly. So I wonder before we go to the next question, if people want to comment on that 
so that we get a bit more feedback from the people around us here. Have we got some experts on fishing? I don't know. <laughs> yes. If you've already spoken, I'm not going to come to you, just to give it a, a, a fair shout. What about European uh, catches coming to be processed in UK ports? What's going to happen there? I think we'll leave that as a question hanging, shall we? Just, just put something to consider because we haven't got the experts there to answer that. I don't think they're all admitting that. Uh, should we go to another question then? What about the young man? This one? Hello? Sorry. Um, we've heard a lot about alternate energy and there's a, bit, a lot mentioned about solar and wind power, but I'd like to know your views on nuclear and if there's going to be any more research into things like fusion. So, um, I, I, I'm agnostic on nuclear. I uh, think that uh, if we can, in a safe way that's consistent with the long-term environmental and economic interests of our country, invest further in nuclear, I have no objection to that, but I'm not sold on the idea completely. I do think there's huge opportunities in fusion and, uh, and that, you know, we've, we've talked about you know, big aspirations to, to invest and to, to make changes uh, with, with, with grand ambition. And I think that might be one of them. I think there is the opportunity to, to, to live a cheap, abundant fuel using that technology. We're some way away from it and the government is investing in research in that area. So I'm hopeful, but I, you know, I guess we've, 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 we've had these uh, Grand ideas before that haven't delivered, but I think there is huge potential in the future. Yeah, I I think we need to be clear that I personally don't see nuclear as a clean energy in the sense of some of the byproducts are not at all clean and are left behind in terms of uranium. I I reckon that we need to focus far more on uh, renewables. We need to be thinking about not only wind and solar, absolutely, but we are an island. Let's think about our wave power. What about the Cardiff Bay project, the lagoon project at the Shell? So we should be thinking much more um, powerfully about the, the wind and the, the waves that, that we can turn to and use. I'm very against fracking, um, and that is something that has actually come up locally. People feel very strongly that we, we shouldn't be uh, pursuing, if you like, dirty older industries, but <coughs> forging forward to a, a newer renewable um, set of uh, strategies. Obviously, there'll be a transition. Obviously, there'll be a transition. I'm not sure that nuclear should be part of that transition myself. Thank you. Okay. So, um, nuclear, um, I think, we're in general, we're a party that, you know, we believe in science, you know, it's not clean, like Rachel says, um, and um, it's, at the moment, is far more expensive than renewables, even with battery backup. So it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, another thing is that having um, nuclear, it actually sort of feeds the whole nuclear weapons business as well. We want to stop that absolutely, completely. So um, we're not, in, you know, so, so um, stop, yeah. Um, stop doing that. Um, for me personally, I mean, if there suddenly was a nuclear fusion solution and that would mean that um, we could, um, you know, get sort of free energy and, you know, that would save us from climate change, okay, well, you know, let, let's look at that. But um, there's a joke about nuclear fusion that it's sort of like, um, you know, it's always 30 years away and it's been that all my life. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I think um, if the option was for a nuclear power station or a wind farm that does outside devices, I think most of you would agree that you would rather the wind farm. I was talking to a data, um, a data scientist recently and she had a really interesting point to point out to me. Is she's really worried about the length of time that nuclear waste needs to be managed for. And she says, what I'm really worried is how people in the future will know the data, where it is, and you know, everything about it. She, and, she made me think about how my um, master's is in computing and earth sciences and um, my dissertation is currently proudly sitting at home on a five and a quarter floppy disk. There's no way I can read that and it was only a few decades ago. 
So how are other people in 50 years' time, 100 years' time, going to be able to access the data that we have about that nuclear waste and where it's stored? So I think we are setting ourselves up for a huge issue in the future. And um, I hope the data scientists will do more about keeping that data accessible than I have done. I'm sure if there's any comments from yeah. here on, on from the audience on that. No, okay, so should we have another question then? Yeah, how about the, the lady there with the, the straight to jump down? Thank you. Um, which party will legislate for a better treatment of boat dwellers compared to the abuse of power and violations of our rights? that we experience from Canal and River Trust and other authorities at present. So I just declare immediately I have no idea about that. I'm very sorry, but that is a really interesting question, and not something that's occurred to me before. So uh, if I were elected, I would look into that as well, I would say. So I do know about it because I live about 10 minutes from the canal, and I have a number of wonderful friends who live live on the canal. People live and work on the canal for all sorts of different reasons and it's not just a place of leisure. It's a place of living. It's a home. So canal dwellers have had a very rough time lately um, and uh, some would describe it actually as harassment at the hands of what's called the canal and riverside river trust. Um, a few years back, it's not that long ago, it's about uh, 2015, there was a new regulation brought in which means that canal dwellers Canal boat trailers, barges need to move up and down, as you may know, much more frequently over longer distances in the same direction. So it's really tough on families with children who are wanting to get to school. It's really tough on the most vulnerable. This is a recurring theme, isn't it? Who need to get access to particular services. So um, <coughs> our friends in the Canal Boat and Barge community have been talking with us in Labour for a while. I work for one who absolutely stand up for their rights and we want to um, bring back a much lighter touch regulation. I think I'm going to have to declare the same that I actually don't know much about the, um, the boat dwellers and what's happening with the canal and river trust. And actually I thank Rachel for knowing something about it and giving us a bit of information. Um, I do recall though in 2017 someone asked a very similar question and I recall that uh, all the candidates at that point said, oh come and talk to us afterwards. So I would say the same thing, that if I was elected then please come and ask me about this, this is something that I would like to know more about. And so I um, you know, absolutely think that we should um, help people who are living on canals to be able to um, um, you know, live and access services like other people. And indeed, um, all sorts of groups in society um, who <coughs> don't live in the normal, in the normal way, um, um, you know, travellers included, um, you know, we need to make sure that everybody can access um, public services um, and schools and health and everything. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> okay, um, I just wonder what the panel think about reporting um, of political events and currently the election in the media and how it could be improved. <laughs> Um, I don't think it, it's done fantastically well at the moment. Um, I think that you know we have um, you know sort of um, hundreds of thousands, thousands, if not millions, of people who support smaller, smaller parties, and they don't get a fair representation. Um, so that's you know should definitely um, be um, be looked into. Um, and I think that. The main press are very much led by the tabloid newspapers 
who are owned by billionaires who have their own special self-interest. And uh, yeah. that yeah. is And there's the ITV leaders debate, which only is uh, between Jeremy Corbyn and Boris Johnson, and Joe Simpson was excluded. Basically, I find that the media is still trying to promote this. It's only a two-party political system, which is basically like a dinosaur. It's time for it to be extinct. We need to have um, better, um, better coverage for all political parties. Um, I don't know quite how we'd get there because at the moment the, most of the papers, as, as Emma said, are owned by these few key people who have their own agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember being somewhat surprised when I was growing up, someone says, oh, well, they support so-and-so because they read that paper. And I thought, really, do people only read the paper that's for the part, you know, that, that, that there's such a close connection. I was quite surprised as a teenager and uh, immediately stopped reading the Daily Mail myself. Um, <laughs> might be a demonstration of the appetite for politics because people here could be watching Boris and, and, and Jeremy uh, slug it out and they're not. Um, so uh, I, I, I take the point about the big media being owned by, by billionaires. I, mean, I don't know quite what the alternative is unless we think we should have state-owned media. But, but I would make the point that actually we have a vastly de democratised news system now. It's called the internet. And that is where most people are getting their, uh, their politics from and their views and their news. And I'm not sure that system works brilliantly either because we have a huge proliferation of, uh, of, of, of fake news and of misinformation and of narrow casting and of echo chambers. So it is not obvious how to construct a news system that is both fair but also um, that, that, that is as inclusive as possible. We need some mediation. Uh, and, uh, and, and all I, my, my small contribution to this, so I, I think this is a huge question I don't have big answers to, I'm afraid, but, but I think the importance of local media uh, is, 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 the opportunity for local media is great, because the internet is, is, is making local news viable again, and it would be great to see the restoration of a proper local news industry. to what people have said rather than repeat because I would agree with a lot of what's been said actually. I think we actually need to continue with Levson 2. I think we, we stopped and that was you know, held at point, but I think we need to continue to review and fundamentally change the way news is reported in this country. We, we, we want to be proud to know that we've been told the truth. That is what good journalists want to do. They want to bring uh, the truth forward. And anything that takes us away from that is incredibly damaging to our democracy. Um, I'm, I'm extremely worried about the hatred and division that is partly turned up by some of the, the, the reporting and the way things are, are painted. Often, when you've been to an event yourself and you think, well, it wasn't, it wasn't like that at all. That's not what he said. That's not how he comes across. Um, and I also think that, um, oh, okay, <laughs> well, I'll end on that. We need, to, we need major review, and I would call for Levison to if I were in Parliament. Another question. How about the gentleman here with the green um, wisdom? He's been waiting now. In five years' time, do you think we'll think that the union has been fatally damaged by Brexit? Um, well, let's hope not. And uh, the, uh, let's hope not. I, uh, I think the union is, is under strain and has been for some time. Brexit is a response to a huge turmoil in our country, in our culture, in our economy, produced by many of the challenges that we've been discussing about the way the economy works, about the fact that many people haven't had wage rises for many years, about a general sense of distress that the country is not going the way that they wanted to. So people have voted for change. And we need to make that change work for the people who voted for it. And we need to uh, honour their aspiration for an independent United Kingdom. I am very concerned about the, the State of the Union. I think we have to have very, make, be very, very deliberate about 
making sure that we, uh, we, we properly invest in all corners of the UK and that we fully uh, uh, we, we, we fulfil the, the, the natural desire of people in the other countries of the UK for more self-governance. So I'm in favour of the devolution programme and I think we could go further. Um, but I think we are, you know, I, I think Brexit will not be the, be, be the factor. I think we need to make sure that this country is successful economically. Uh, and that people in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland recognise the value of, of, of UK membership. And in five years' time, let's hope we're not even talking about Brexit anymore. So there are many pressures on the union, which, which is a precious union, I think. Um, Brexit has opened up uh, some unintended divisions, I think. Um, they could have been predicted, but they weren't. And I'm going to touch on Ireland, actually. Um, I'm very concerned about the effect that a crash-out deal will have. Um, if you think about the Good Friday Agreement, I remember Mo Molan taking off her wig and throwing it onto the table at one crucial point in the negotiations. That um, Labour government uh, negotiated the, the Good Friday Agreement. It was an important and painstaking peace work that was done to bring peace. And we, we put that at our peril of any kind of danger. And so I think that's another aspect of, of, of damage within the union, if you like, that we are um, you know, in danger of walking into. Um, I'm, I'm just very concerned that where we're heading, and Danny, I remember at the Pusey hustings, you know, you said a bit earlier on, and this was under a question from Eleanor Goodman, that uh, you felt that if, if you didn't get to a, an agreed deal, you would be prepared to go for no deal. And that just worries me enormously. Mm -hmm. I'm very worried about us keeping the union together if we leave uh, the EU. Um, it's quite clear that the people of Scotland want to remain, and they feel that they have not been heard in any way. So my simple answer is let's not leave the EU, let's stay in the EU, let's keep our union intact. I okay, agree um, very much with, with um, um, Joe that if, if we, um, I'm sure if we crash out, I think it's, it's going to cause um, many, many more problems. We're going to um, yeah, not, there's going to be a lot of issues that are unresolved. Um, Ireland is, I think, perhaps more of a worry to me than Scotland, like Rachel. Um, what what um, is, in a very general sense, talking about um, um, democracy and things, we would like to see um, much more devolution to um, different um, <coughs> areas so that um, you know, sort of more um, devolution. Not, not just to Scotland, but also to areas um, in England, um, and not have everything concentrated at Westminster. should be more communities that are sort of in charge or it's, it's more the big society over there that it's up to them to be helping the people rather than the governments. Okay, um, so um, I think it, it, it's um, fantastic to have local people um, in control. However, it doesn't work unless the whole money financial system is working. And at the moment, the city is like a sort of, you know, big vacuum cleaner that sucks all the money out of the regions into the city of London. So unless we actually organise the economy differently, you know, you're asking a, almost the impossible. So here we're quite lucky, there's quite a few quite wealthy people, so yes, they can put their, their efforts into charities and things. What about the areas which don't have so many wealthy people? You know, they, 
you know, they they need to rely on food banks and you know there isn't a lot of people who can build this big society because everybody's completely stressed out financially. So we just need to reorganise the economy. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned yet, I'm going to throw in, is that we'd like to see a universal basic income. So we'd like to see everybody get, I think it's £86 a week, um, and then um, and also have um, housing benefit. And um, there's been various studies on this, and it looks like it makes a lot of sense. Um, but, uh, <laughs> because of um, a lot of people who normally give are just cutting back that little bit and that sort of thing. And I'm really surprised by some of the uh, things that are actually done by charity, which I would have thought that the um, state would be providing. And the reason why I've gone blank is I was just really trying to think of an example and, and numbers coming. Um, so I would like to see us look to, for the ways to engage and devolve decisions down to the various different levels of local government, but along with the decision and the decision making needs to flow the money. Uh, so I think there were, there were some practical problems with the way the big society agenda was implemented and it was a difficult time to be doing it alongside really significant uh, public sector funding cuts. But the principle I completely agree with, and I think it is, it's both old fashioned, but it's also the future for communities to take responsibility for themselves. And it is so uh, enriching for everybody involved. And, you know, I'm afraid I don't accept the, uh, the point that, that, that the only rich people have the opportunity to be good neighbours or to, to support their communities. And it's quite the reverse of the case. We know that actually people on low income are more generous with their time and their money than wealthy people. So there is huge resource, of, not just of money, but of time, expertise, compassion, experience in our communities. And I mentioned some of the ones that just, you know, found, found out about today. Another one quickly to mention is the volunteer link in this area. So, you know, the, the idea that the government, any, anything that's important or necessary, it should be state funded and state organised. I don't accept. So the volunteer link is for particularly elderly people to get to the GP, and that's a problem with rural transport, as we know. There's, there's a system across the constituency whereby people volunteer to drive people to the doctor. That is just a great blessing, and it's a blessing obviously for the people who have to get the doctor, it's also a blessing for the people who are doing it. It's making our community stronger, and I think that is a really great model that I'm continuing to do. I agree with the idea of service in the community in that sense, and I would see part of my job as an MP as being a servant of the people in that old sense of the word. But public services, public services, in fact those two words, are under huge pressure. They're being pushed back, eroded over time, and that's continuing. And I see in my own volunteering that I do, um, exhausted volunteers, mm -hmm. exhausted by the amount that we're having to shoulder, because we are filling the gap that has been left by the deregulation and the pushing back of public services. So working at Open Doors here in Devizes, I was shocked, as some of us are, as we walk about our daily lives in, in all towns around here, we see homeless people, we see people sleeping rough, we see food bank use being quite normal, including for people who are in work. And this is not acceptable. We are a wealthy nation, this is a relatively wealthy um, community and constituency, but there are areas in our constituency where we fall into the top 30% most deprived parts of the country. That's a statistic thing, but that's including central Glasgow and parts of East London. Top 30% in this constituency. That has to change. It's a very short one. What would you do? What would you do with the fixed term Parliament Act? Yeah, good. Okay, what would we do with the fixed term Parliament Act?
like citizens' assemblies, especially to look at um, difficult problems. Um, yeah, I haven't got any comment on the fixed side problem, but... I think it kind of um, worked quite well, because it meant that Boris couldn't just have his election when he, when he said he wanted it. <laughs> um, I think during the coalition, it actually made the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives work together because they have that agreement to make it last for five years. Unfortunately. I kind of sort of think that I was a little disappointed it was so easy to maybe work around it. Um, it be interesting to have a look at it in more detail. Um, well, I'm sorry we've had having an election if you don't want one. Um, <laughs> and I appreciate lots of people don't want an election now either, but um, I, the fact that Parliament was completely stuck, it was, it was paralysed, we had no functioning government, no functioning Parliament, so I had to uh, be dissolved, and thankfully the parties uh, recognised that. W uh, we'd scrapped the fixed term Parliament Act, it was a stitch up between David Cameron and Nick Clegg to maintain stability for the coalition government. It should have been a time limited policy that only lasted for that government and then lapsed in 2015. They forgot to add that at all, so it carried on. We had all the mess we've had in the last few months as a result. So we scrapped it. Again, I think we would need to look. Um, completely afresh at the way we do politics. Um, I am constantly disappointed, and that's why I got involved a couple of years ago, as I said um, in opening remarks. I'm constantly disappointed in the way our, where our parliament has got to, in the way uh, we are governed. Um, it's, some of it is actually institutional, and we need to just really review how we operate. And I would agree with Emma with the thought of we need to bring local democracy back to people. We need to set up citizen assemblies. So, for example, I'm going to be doing some work in Pusey where we work with young people in an, in an informal environment in a kind of young youth citizen's assembly. We need to think of creative ways of re-engaging with people. And frankly, those, those people up on the base seats in, in London, um, I hope that they are all, we are all, and I include us in that, um, getting a wake-up call, because this really is time for a wake-up call. Thank you. So now we're going to allow each of the candidates to have two minutes to <coughs> say anything else they want to add, or add anything to any of their answers, or remind us of anything in particular they want us to remember as we've been moving to a close. Um, we're well, going to have to go around to the way we started, so where would like to start? Okay. Um, I'd like to start by quoting from um, Antonio Guterres, the United Nations Secretary General, who said, um, I urge leaders to um, unite be behind the science and take ambitious, urgent action to halt global heating and set a path towards a safer, more sustainable future for all. So we were a great country, we invented the machines powered by burning fossil fuels um, that started the Industrial Revolution. Um, and this has improved the lives of billions of people around the globe. Well, let's make this country a great country again and show the world how to live prosperous and happy lives without fossil fuels. So vote green for that. in this election, we can either have the isolationist Brexit to satisfy the hardliners hard liners remaining what used to be the Conservative Party, or we can think again. We can now see that Brexit is the worst deal in history, rather than the easiest deal, and we can see that Brexit would lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom. Let's vote to keep the United Kingdom as a United Kingdom. A country with influence that plays a full role within the EU, the single most successful collaboration of proud nations that the world has ever seen. Vote to, bit, to fix our broken political system, to protect our planet, and to rebuild a society that cares about all of its citizens. Vote Liberal Democrat. I'm 
sorry we haven't had a chance to discuss some other matters like the state of the rural economy and, and farming or the military, which are such important presences in the constituency. And just if, if anyone is interested, I'm very committed to, to those agendas and would be very happy to have conversations afterwards or, uh, or, or over email about those, those matters. Um, what we really have seen tonight is how divided our community is by Brexit. And, you know, we have got to come together as a country. That has got to be our overwhelming political priority. Uh, and I guess the choice for us all at this election is, is how to do that. And one option, which is my opponents have a sort of variations of, which is to go back, to disregard the decision that was taken three years ago because it's now proved to be too difficult or, uh, uh, you know, it was the wrong thing to do and therefore we should, uh, we should disregard that vote and either put it, go back to the people for a second vote or, or, or undo it altogether. Uh, I ask you to consider seriously how, what that would do to the unity of this country, whether that would be the way to unite us once again, or whether we should go forward. And that means honouring the referendum, delivering on the mandate that was promised by the politicians, promised by all the main political parties, and get Brexit done so that we can then come together and deliver a genuinely one nation united agenda again in the future. absolutely do face a choice at this election and it is about what kind of country and what kind of politics we want. Do we want the status quo, which would be the status quo here? A Tory-led government with a piecemeal approach to investment, no vision from political leaders for Britain, but focused on really short-term profits, benefiting just the very few at the top. Um, that would involve deregulating our economy, selling off various parts of, of the NHS, I'm quite convinced of that, to Trump. A crash-out Brexit deal which will decimate our businesses, the most vulnerable, and our environment. Do we really want to be led by a man who, sorry to quote the 350 million again, but that we know was a lie. Do we want to be led by Boris and his chums who favour corporate greed, bosses paying themselves outrageous amounts of money, and exploiting their workforce very often. You can vote for Labour, you can vote for Rachel, and what you'll get is a local woman committed to campaigning to change things for real. Labour will bring real change to devices. Labour will put our energy into rebuilding Britain, widening prosperity beyond the City of London, as we've said, and re-energising re the whole country with a green industrial revolution. So Labour's vote is for real change, a green industrial revolution putting people and planet before profit and privilege. participating. Um, just in case you need reminding, please do vote. Uh, <laughs> and if you want to vote, um, you've only got a week to register, so you need to hurry up if you're not already registered. I think Keith would like to close. I would just like to add some uh, additional facts. Uh, thank you Sue for chairing uh, this evening. <laughs> Thank you to Phil and Divided School and the AB team for uh, hosting us again, uh, which is just brilliant, so thank you so much. And um, one person that you, none of you will know, um, or very few of you will know, uh, who actually brought this together and made this happen is uh, the guy here in the suit, Elliot Wallace, who's uh, um, got all the candidates together and got the uh, promotion out there. So, uh, thank you, Elliot.